David Davis out. Boris Johnson out. Has the UK Prime Minister cleared the air? Or is Theresa May circling the wagons? It's crisis mode at Westminster. The resignation of her foreign and Brexit ministers follows last Friday's closed-door retreat at Chequers, the Prime Minister's country residence. Uh, there, uh, May chose in favor of a deal that keeps trade flowing with the continent and the border open with Ireland. Will the resignations weaken or, in the end, strengthen her hand? The balance of power within the cabinets, the awkward reflection of what's true more broadly in British politics. The majority of lawmakers on both sides of the aisles who campaigned in favor of remaining in the European Union faced with a majority of constituents who voted to leave, which means we're still asking, well, what kind of Brexit uh, for Britain? The government's promising to spell out the answer publicly with a white paper to be published on Thursday, which, by the way, is the eve of Theresa May's second anniversary in office. We'll know then if she's truly overcome the infighting in her cabinet. Some predict a vote of no confidence before Donald Trump comes to town on an official visit at week's end. Today in the France uh, 24 debate, we're looking at the cabinet crisis across the channel. And with us to talk about it from London, Patrick Sullivan, who is uh, the CEO of uh, the uh, uh, think tank Parliament Street. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. When we welcome from Belfast, uh, blogger uh, of uh, Unionist, editor of Unionist uh, Voice, uh, Jamie Bryson, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Here in the studio, uh, we welcome uh, journalist and commentator Alex Taylor. How are you? Hi. And uh, as well, Jacques-Marie Lossian, member of parliament from Emmanuel Macron's La République en Marche party. Good evening. And, and uh, member of uh, a, a task force, I guess you could call it, mission. on Brexit. Mission. In French, it's called a mission. But, uh, yes. Uh, 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 on, on Brexit, which has taken you uh, to the UK and uh, both sides of uh, the Irish uh, border, the France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. And you can weigh in on the conversation, the hashtag F24 uh, debate. Yeah, we could show you that it's uh, right now a uh, stakeout mode outside of uh, the uh, foreign ministry. Uh, we're going to have, uh, well, the announcement uh, regarding uh, Boris Johnson's uh, successor. Uh, he's uh, just been speaking to the BBC and uh, he has said, we're headed for the status of a colony. Uh, Johnson, uh, who in further remarks says, the Brexit dream is dying, suffocated by needless uh, self-doubt. Uh, um, his resignation letter has been published uh, on a blog. He adds that uh, we've postponed crucial decision, including the preparations for a no-deal Brexit. It's all happening, what with, at the same time, uh, Theresa May meeting with members of her Conservative Party in Parliament, Parliament where she spoke earlier. Turning to Brexit, Mr Speaker, I want to pay tribute to my right honourable friends, <laughs> the members... The members the members for Horton Price and Howden and Uxbridge and South Ryslip for their work over the last two years. We do, we do not agree about the best way of delivering our shared commitment to honour the result of the referendum. The referendum. Two years of sound bites indecision and cabinet infighting. It's only this weekend that the cabinet managed to agree a negotiating position among itself. And that illusion lasted 48 hours. There are now only a few months left until these negotiations are supposed to conclude. We have a crisis in government, two secretaries of state have resigned, and still, we are no clearer on what future relationship with our nearest neighbours and biggest partners will look like. Patrick Sullivan, what's going on right now in London? Uh, well, everything's going on. Uh, I think uh, this is the end for Theresa May. I can't see her holding on to power now. She's lost the biggest beast in her cabinet. And um, she's going to be, I think... Uh, she hasn't played her trump card, uh, which is, ironically, an actual trump card. 
uh, you know, the uh, American president recently said to the French president, uh, if you left the EU, we'd give you a great trade deal, a big, beautiful trade deal. Uh, but we haven't uh, even approached him in relation to that. We should be using our special relationship with America. Um, Donald Trump is coming to the UK on, um, on Friday. And I think that this time round, when the Conservative Party elect a leader, they might not be able to have a leader who wrote the art of the deal, but can we at least have a leader that's read it? Uh, Alex Taylor, are we writing <laughs> off Theresa May too quickly? Well, my problem this afternoon was uh, I was trying to tweet uh, something which sums up the whole situation. I wanted to tweet a Monty Python sketch, and I couldn't decide whether it's best to tweet that Brexit has become a dead parrot, because it's that thing where they, you have to explain that the parrot is dead, Brexit is, is dying, or that sketch, I don't know if you know, where um, there's a soldier and they cut off one arm and he carries on. They cut off the other arm and he oh, yes, carries on. Monty Python, not yeah, and then real. he cut off one leg and then they cut off the other leg and he still carries Draw. on. It reminded it's me that, of that when I was watching Theresa May this afternoon. I mean, how much longer can she go on and this, this idea of Brexit, which is dying a, a, a death... And it's all being exposed to public view. I mean, it's, 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 uh, you couldn't make it up. It's, it's, it's worse than the Monty Python sketch. Jamie Bryson, you agree? Well, I don't think Brexit is dead. I think it has got a new lease of life now that the Brexiteers appear to be fighting back against the Prime Minister. I think there was a number of commitments made to the British people, uh, such as we would be leaving the customs union, we would be leaving the single market, we would be outside the jurisdiction uh, of European Court of Justice. And I think in many ways the deal that the Prime Minister came up with uh, last week doesn't deliver on any of them promises. We would essentially uh, still be in the customs union, albeit by a different name. Uh, we would essentially still be in a single market, albeit by a different name. And we would, in, in a vast amount of areas, still be subject to the European Court of Justice. Uh, and that just simply doesn't deliver uh, on what the British people voted for. So I don't think it's any surprise. Uh, that a number of, of members of the cabinet have now decided to, to resign, and I think it's the only principled stand that they could take. I think we may see more resignations, uh, and I would agree with Patrick. I don't think Theresa May can survive this. Theresa May can't survive this. Jacques Marie Notion? Uh, I'm a member of the French Parliament, so uh, please allow me not to take a position on, on, on this. Uh, I'm just back from, from Ireland. We, we were with the delegation of the French Parliament. We were in, in Dublin and we were in, in Belfast. Uh, let's give you my, my feelings. Uh, we have seen a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of doubt. Um, on both sides of the uh, Irish border. People are really frightened by a chaotic uh, Brexit, especially a hard Brexit. It, this will destroy economy on both sides. So when so, you heard Theresa May in the Commons earlier saying they're going to work out a deal so that you won't have this problem in Ireland, there'll be the free movement, most notably, of goods. Um, uh, the, the, the main question is how can you check, how can you control goods on both sides of the border. So uh, you have only two options, only two options. One is the, the backstop option that Mr. Uh, Barney has proposed, which means you create a border in the Irish Sea to control what's entering the Isle of Ireland, both uh, Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, or you are maintaining the uh, UK in the Custom Union. That's all. Patrick Sullivan? Yeah, but... Um, well... Uh, I think, uh, going back to the politics of it, just I want to pick up on one point. If there is a leadership election, uh, Theresa May will not be able to be a candidate because uh, what's happening now is the 1922 committee, which is the committee uh, of Conservative members of Parliament, have apparently, and it's been reported by Ian Dale, who's a very respected uh, broadcaster, uh, that they have received the 48 letters necessary to force a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister loses that vote, then she will not be able to stand as a candidate in a forthcoming election. But hang election. on a second. You just heard Jacques-Marie Lossian describe the impossible situation in which any leader is in Britain right now. Who's going to want her job? I, I think the job of British Prime Minister is a pretty <laughs> nice job. Uh, <laughs> I think there's plenty of people. Within the Conservative Party, who's going to want it? Seriously. Uh, I think there's a number of names of people who... Um, 
Who Mark comes Walton, to mind? Who? I want names. Well, David Davis, for one. I mean, he's the first person who resigned. And then the person that has reported uh, that uh, these uh, letters of no confidence have been received by the 1922 committee, uh, this broadcaster Ian Dale, he's also the person who ran uh, Mr Davis's uh, 2005 uh, leadership uh, contest. I uh, read in The Times the other day that Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, a, a sort of... Um, uh, I, I suppose he's being compared to sort of... British Trump, um, he's uh, been looking for a PR firm and there's a group called Reignite which have 150,000 grassroots members who are ready to campaign for Mr Rees-Mogg should he put his uh, name into the hat. And of course there's always Boris Johnson because yeah, everyone loves Boris. All right, let's go over those names. First of all, you mentioned Jacob Rees-Mogg. We're going to listen to him. Uh, he, the line laid down at uh, Chequers, the uh, British Prime Minister's retreat over the weekend. Has uh, the hard Brexiters had the hard Brexiters over the weekend on paper uh, backing the Prime Minister while blasting her policies? So Jacob Rees-Mogg, who said that uh, the problem with checkers, Alex Taylor, is not is that it is not a U-turn, it's a handbrake turn, and suddenly it's staying effectively in the single market for goods and agri-goods. Yeah, this is Jacob Rees-Mogg, who's just um, outsourced uh, some of his financial uh, activities to um, Dublin in order to uh, safeguard them uh, against uh, Brexit. Uh, and who's um, against abortion, who's against gay rights. I, I, I mean, it's... Uh, it's uh, you, you say, uh, for once, I'm going to agree with the Brexiteer. I think, I think it would actually be quite good if a Brexiteer was in charge, if somebody like Boris Johnson or Jacob Rees-Mogg became uh, Prime Minister. Can Boris, Johnson, own... can Boris Johnson be Prime Minister of well, England? Well, of course he can. I mean, and, of, of, of Britain. Of, uh, whoever knows what's going to happen. I mean, British politics is so... Well, so two weeks ago, he, he, the leaked to the press those remarks where he said, I'll say politely, screw business when it came to the negotiations. Yeah, it was so-called uh, current uh, Brexit uh, deal uh, a turd. Um, I, but I, I think it would probably be a good idea for Brexit and for Britain in general, even though I'm totally, as you probably understood, against Brexit, if the, the Brexiteers actually get a chance to own their Brexit and assume the consequences. Because the problem at the moment is they're always going to be able to say, yes, but um, Brexit didn't work because we weren't in charge. I think they should be given the chance to, to go there and to try and negotiate with a huge group of 460 million people and see that it's not that easy to just say, oh, but we're Britain, we'll get what we want, and we're going to cherry pick. And they'll have to deal with the very difficult problems that Theresa May just simply can't deal with. And then afterwards, they'll have to own the Brexit. I mean, I think it would be fantastic if one of them, Jacob Rees-Mogg or Boris Johnson, actually had to uh, deliver the goods of Brexit, which for me are totally undeliverable. But then they won't be able to say afterwards that it was everybody else's fault, because that's what they say. They say it's Remainers, they say it's Ireland, they say, they, they say it's Brussels. Um, own it. Uh, become prime minister and try and deal with it. And try and deal with the, the problem that we're talking about today is how can you say um, we, we don't want to be in the same customs union as the European Union, and yet we don't want to have a border with that customs union. It's unicorn speak. It's, it's ridiculous. It's fantasy land. And yet that's what the Brexiteers say at the moment, because they don't have to actually try and find a workable solution. There isn't one. Jamie Bryson? Well, I, I want to come back at one point in relation to the, the border in Northern Ireland, and it was, it was stated that there was two options, and that was staying in the customs union or a border in the Irish Sea. Well, a border in the Irish Sea is simply constitutionally unacceptable. Uh, it would put a border within the, the United Kingdom's internal market, but apart from that, it would divide uh, Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom constitutionally. Uh, that would be entirely unacceptable. So you're uh, in favour of a hard border? Union because, well, uh, people need to accept that there will be a, a land border between the United Kingdom and the European Union. So if there has to be customs checks on that border, I, I cannot understand, and I haven't been able to understand since the very beginning of Brexit, as to why we are shying away from that. If there is going to be young. a border, then let's make it as much as possible. 
I, no. Could I just react to that? I've, I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember, I, like, um, I left Britain at the end of the 70s. Every time you put the television on, on news bulletin during the 70s, there was a bomb threat from the IRA. Yes. I mean, when I hear things like this, saying I can understand why there shouldn't be a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, I mean... That's one of the. Uh, I left point. Britain. You couldn't. Oh, you couldn't turn on the television without there being problems. It was the most heavily well, well, armed um, well, uh, frontier in yes. Europe at the time. You, you're absolutely right. We, we were in Dublin. Yeah. We were in Belfast. We have met people from all ki all parties. They are paying great attention to the Good Friday Agreement, and for them, a hard Brexit is a threat to the Good Friday Agreement, because the Good Friday Agreement is not just peace, it's uh, a lot of uh, parameters of uh, authorization, uh, explain, uh, m making everything possible for the two communities to live together. And if you have a hard Brexit, if you have a war between the two uh, sides of Ireland, you are totally threatening and destroying the Good Friday Agreement. So everybody in Ireland, no, no, maybe no, no. except the DUP, it, who has not voted for the Good Friday Agreement, but all other parties are in favour of maintaining the Good Friday Agreement. Jamie Bryson? So, uh, the, the, the Belfast, it's, uh, its legal name is the Belfast Agreement, and the, the legislative mechanism behind it is the Northern Ireland Act 1998. This argument has already been tested in court, whereby people went to court to say that Brexit uh, would, would breach the Belfast Agreement, and the court dismissed that. So there's absolutely no threat to the legal text of the Belfast Agreement, which is the Northern Ireland Act 1998. It would be absolutely absurd to suggest uh, that, that the British Parliament could not put a border within their sovereign territory uh, and would need the permission of what is essentially a foreign jurisdiction to do that. It would leave Northern Ireland with some type of hybrid British-Irish status. But let me go back to the point uh, that was made about the, about the IRA. If we follow the logic of that, what we're then essentially saying is that dem democratic politics uh, can be held hostage by those who would threaten violence. Uh, and that just cannot be. Uh, we, we cannot make our democratic decisions based on the fact that people may engage in violence. That is totally absurd, and it would be a, a moral stain on the British Parliament if they were to give in to that. If, you know, if somebody turned around and said, uh, well, if you take this decision in Parliament, we're going to blow up London, how absurd would it be if Parliament bowed down to that and said, OK, well, we, we will shape our policies based upon uh, what terrorism threatens. It would be an, an absolute disgrace. So I think this argument that some kind of threat to peace is an absolute nonsense. I live in Northern Ireland. Nobody wants to engage in violence. There is no, uh, the only people engaging in violence is a small, uh, unrepresentative minority dissident Republican groups. Uh, so there's no threat to violence. There's no chance of going back uh, to a, 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 a civil uh, conflict here within Northern Ireland. And I think those suggestions are, uh, quite frankly, blackmail as an attempt to, to derail Brexit per se by those who are entirely opposed to the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. Jacques-Marie de Sion, blackmail? No, it's uh, pure yes, reality. Yes, it, it is blackmail when you... No, what is uh, no, frightening... No, it is blackmail is... when you say... No. Well, when you say, when you say to people that you cannot make you, your, your democratic policy uh, policies and, 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 and your policy decisions should be shaped around uh, a threat of violence. Well, that is blackmail. If you're so keen on democracy, um, how do you get around explaining the fact that the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain? I mean, the, the fact that you're insisting that all of a sudden they come out Well, that's of, absurd. That's uh, absurd. Let me do... I Let mean, me the majority of people in Northern uh, Ireland the, voted the, the, to remain, so you're not being if, very democratic if, either. If you... Well, if you'd let me deal with that point, let's follow the logic of what you're saying. The United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union as one. We joined as one. We voted to leave as one. It was not a regional vote. It was a UK-wide vote. And within that vote, the United Kingdom as a whole voted to leave. If we follow the logic of your position, uh, should we keep you know, London voted to remain? Will we keep London in the European Union? Will we start annexing parts of the United Kingdom off? It's an absolute nonsense. Even the, the Belfast Agreement, which you've referenced, uh, makes very clear that Northern Ireland is an integral part of the United Kingdom. So therefore, the United Kingdom voted to leave. What is it you're advocating, that we start annexing off towns and cities or, or regions of the United Kingdom uh, that voted to remain? Is that the absurd situation that you're advocating? No, you're the one who's suggesting we put up borders again. I'm saying that the situation is perfectly fine as it is, and thanks to the, the, the fact that the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland belong to the same union, that that's helped the process let of me, peace let me bring in years. Exactly. Let me uh, it's not blackmail, it's just reality. What I, uh, I am really frightened by the fact that a lot of people, not only the elites, but also the uh, average people, are, have voted based on lies and illusion for Brexit. 
they honestly didn't know what it means to Brexit, right? And nowadays you see what it means. We have been together for the last 45 years, an integration between the two, the, the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe, okay? So you cannot destroy 45 years of a strong and close relationship to, just like that. And if you remember what happened during the campaign, a lot of Brexiters promised that if you have the Brexit, you will get a lot of money from the Brexit to serve the NHS. It was a lie. And, as and everybody for, knows that. As for democracy, I made the, made the point I always make that um, France has 11 uh, members of parliament which represent French people all around the world who continue to be able to vote for the rest of their lives. People like me who um, are British and who live abroad uh, for more than uh, 15 years and have had all our rights taken away by Brexit weren't you even allowed vote. to vote. And also young people, 16 to 18, who could vote in the Scottish referendum weren't allowed to vote in the Brexit. Uh, had, referendum. So saying it's democratic, there are also reasons to say that perhaps the, the vote would have been different if people were allowed to vote. I mean, I don't see why I shouldn't vote, but all my rights have been taken away. Patrick Sullivan, let me ask you, because the question a lot of people are asking on this side of the channel is, OK, let's say uh, right now it is a hard Brexit. Let's say there is no deal because well, there's only three months left to negotiate something with the rest of the European Union. Yeah. Right. Uh, afterwards, what's the knock on effect for Scotland, uh, will and we heard Scottish uh, uh, members of the uh, Scottish National Party, the SNP, uh, in the uh, Parliament at Westminster, uh, very harsh uh, this Monday. Uh, does it mean that uh, we could have a second independence referendum in Scotland? No, I think what's happening now is we're looking at ways we can nitpick uh, Brexit and nitpick the people's vote and the people's choice. The people made a choice. Uh, they made a choice once before. 75% of people in 1975 voted to join the European Union. Instead of people loving the... That was after being a member for about two years. Instead of people's love for the institution growing, it decreased immeasurably. So um, I, I think a lot of people want to sort of cause problems, boring headlines, things like that. Uh, make it difficult so people just sort of throw their hands up in the air and say, oh, well, let, let's just give up on this. I think we need a change of leadership in London, in Westminster, in the United Kingdom, where we uh, have somebody bold, brash, come in uh, to the negotiating chambers of Europe and say to these Eurocrats, well, OK, you might think you know how to make deals, but we're getting advice from the guy who wrote the art of the deal. So right. you think 60, so, yeah, you think 60 million people uh, is going to be is, is always going to win against 460 million people simply because of what? Because of nostalgia? Because who we are? I mean, it's if you're talking about the art of the deal, because I've read the book by Trump too, and one of the things that Trump says is he, he talks about the power you have. I mean, look at it. The mathematics are simply there. 60 million do not have the same clout as 460 million. Go read the book again. It doesn't apply. Uh, you're just talking. You're just talking numbers. There's a lot of numbers in the world, and there's a lot of people we can. But they're do important deals ones. With. Numbers make give give you clout and give you economic might. Well, they might. are important numbers. Let's look at let's look at it's which terrible. countries are growing. You, you which can't we say have that. Special relationships with. You can't say uh, that in terms of their economy. You can't well, say that. Sorry, there's only there's only there's only actually when we talk about numbers, there's only actually one number that matters here, and that number is over 17.4 million people voted within the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. Yeah, that 50, is the number 52%. That, that is what has to be, deli what has to be delivered. Pa Patrick Sullivan, uh, I want to go back to something you said earlier. The prospect of Prime Minister Johnson, how realistic yeah. is that? Very realistic. Why not? We've got President Trump. We've got <laughs> President Macron, which, uh, I mean, what he did was extraordinary. Uh, we've, got, we've had Brexit. We voted for Brexit. People said that wouldn't happen. Uh, I think uh, in this sort of world, Prime Minister Boris Johnson sounds yeah, kind of run of the mill now. Can I ask you what? Can, I, can we just ask you one, one, one advantage of Brexit? What's it brought? What's it brought the country so far? What was what's the massive advantage you can quote already uh, from Brexit? Let, 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 I'm, I'm just genuinely, on, honestly interested to hear what you think Brexit, how that's worth. made people's lives better so far, two years on. Uh, I'm not going to engage with the question. Well, I think you're just better that you lost oh, the we, vote. We, we at the um, I can't answer. 
I can you answer. Tell us. Because we, we had meetings for our missions. We had meetings at the 9 Downing Street and 10 Downing Street. Uh, we also met with uh, the Under Secretary of State, Mr. Steve Baker. For, for them, for the Brexiters, the answer is simple. Autonomy, liberty, tax autonomy, and better terms and conditions with the rest of the world. Well, if that was the case, how come Germany already does twice the amount of trade with China being in the EU than Britain does? How is that possible? If it was possible to be so much and more you know engaged the with these emerging econ economies outside the European Union, how does a Brexiteer explain to me that Germany already does twice the amount of trade with China while it's in the European Union than Britain does. How is, uh, how is that possible? This so is exactly what I objected to Mr. Baker, and the answer was, we can have better high-level free trade agreements because of the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth? Yes. So I think uh, a vast part uh, or minority of the uh, English elites is living on an illusion. So we're going to sell our fruit, our fruit and they vegetables They still believe they can Australia. make it. Yes. <laughs> Patrick, or India, or India. Patrick Sullivan. The elite yep. are trying to stop Brexit. Uh, well, I mean, we do have special relationships with the Commonwealth, and we, we've had great discussions. Uh, Liam Fox has done a great job as International Trade Secretary. Which of the uh, deals he the, suggested are going to work then so far? Because from what we've heard, for example, uh, India doesn't work because they want much more freedom of movement, which is going to be a big spoke in the wheels because most people who voted for Brexit don't want more freedom of movement. Well, and I, I India are insisting on way day, more the visas the for their, the for their well, students. I'm not going to debate like a debate that ended like two years ago. I'm going well, to give us some examples now. I'm going to debate the politics of today. The politics of go, today go for it. Go is for that it. we might have a change of leadership and a leader who believes in Brexit, who has, who offers us bold colours, not pale pastels, who is able to deliver a vision for Brexit. Theresa May didn't believe in Brexit. She was given the job because she was a pair of safe hands. To do something as bold and as brilliant as Brexit, you need somebody bold and brilliant. And you need somebody who believes in it. But we have, we have wasted two years, right? Yeah, time to run. UK voted two years ago, and now we still don't know let what me, they are. Let me put it to Jamie Bryson. Time is running short because once a deal is agreed, it has to be approved by the national parliaments of the other uh, 27. Some are saying, well, maybe October at the latest. Can, right. Is that still possible? Can the UK and Europe seal a deal by October? Well, I, I think we're at the stage we're at now. I don't think. I don't think the deal that was put forward last week uh, by the Cabinet is going to, to stand. I think Theresa May will either have to uh, move away from that or I think she will fall as Prime Minister. And I think the next Prime Minister will obviously have to revisit that uh, and adopt it to ensure that it actually does deliver what the British people voted for. I think right now uh, the potential is that we will leave the European Union with no deal. Uh, I think the European Union have been uh, entirely uh, unflexible. I think they have been extremely intransigent uh, as to how they've dealt with. And I have to say, you know, living in Northern Ireland, the, the conduct of, of the Irish government in relation to this has been extremely aggressive, and they have been emboldened in that by the European Union, and I don't think that that, is, that has helped at all. So, uh, in, in my regard, as a Brexiteer, if we have to leave uh, with no deal, well, no deal is better than the, the, the deal that is on the table at the minute, which would consign us to uh, being a vassal state in perpetuity, uh, uh, and I just don't think that that's that's acceptable, and that's not what we voted for. We need to we need to leave the customs union, uh, uh, the customs union by whatever name, by whatever method. We need to leave the single market, and that's a single market, regardless if it is a de facto single market. Uh, and we need to leave the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice uh, and what is being put forward by the and Prime Minister. How do you fix the border issue? How do you fix the border issue? Well, the, the, the border let me know, issue is let this. Me know. There's going to have to be customs. There is going to have to be customs checks between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland because it is an EU land border. So we you have are to restoring a border. So there's going to be customs checks. You are restoring a border between the two parts of Ireland. You are restoring a border. There's border. There is a, there, hold on. There's already an economic. There's already an economic border because the two the two parts of Ireland uh, both have have different uh, have different money. You know. But one part of Northern Ireland uh, has the pound, uh, and the Republic of Ireland has has the euro. So there's really economic differences there. But there is a border. The no. Northern Ireland is a sovereign part of the United Kingdom, and the Irish the Irish Republic 
It's a sovereign nation. So no, it's a lie. Border, it's a lie, so sir. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. There is no border. I've been, I've been there. There is no border. You can walk along Hold the on. street. But you can the, walk along the road. There is no border. Let me bring in Patrick Sullivan. Yeah, but, but yeah, uh, Patrick Sullivan. Yeah. Let, let me ask you. Constitutionally, there's a border. <laughs> let me ask you this. Theresa May, what she defended before Parliament this Monday was mm -hmm. a deal whereby you would have free movement on goods and agricultural products in particular. Uh, no, no free movement of services. Uh, no free movement of uh, uh, of services, mm. and you, uh, of course, uh, would no longer be uh, part of the common agricultural policy. Uh, right now, uh, is that the best? Is it is it better to have something of that ilk, or as uh, you just heard Jamie Bryson argue, a no deal Brexit? Uh, I think uh, that. Uh uh, what Theresa May put for the British uh, Parliament was uh, Brexit with uh, our hands tied behind our backs, really. Um, and uh, going to this whole thing about the Irish border, uh, that could be settled, to be quite honest, uh, pretty easily uh, if the EU wasn't playing such hardball with Britain. You know, they're playing politics with people's safety. Um, we should be willing to play equal hardball with, uh, with the EU. We should say, because the EU and NATO happen to co-align, co well, Mr Barnier, you say we haven't been paying our bar tab or we've got a bit of our bar tab le left to pay. Well, let's look at which countries have contributed towards NATO. Maybe until certain countries like Germany, for What's example. What's that got to do with the border? Uh, What's that got to, to do, do with, with the border? border? What on earth are you talking about? It has no relevance saying, whatsoever to the border. In the same sense, you, you said that the solution to the Irish border is to threaten people with their NATO contributions. What? I mean, it's just pure rubbish. We're running a little short on time, so I just want to read a couple of reactions. Uh, first of all, uh, one from a viewer on the hashtag F24Debate. As a remainder, I'm delighted Brexit's unraveling, but Boris Johnson and David Davis would have served their misguided calls better if they'd supported a soft Brexit and then disengaged further from Europe over time. As it stands, they may never get what they wanted. A few reactions coming in from the UK Parliament. Uh, one is from the uh, chair of the Conservative Party. Brandon Lewis says he does not expect a confidence vote. And uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, the uh, con uh, Eurosceptic British lawmaker, saying he neither expects there to be a confidence motion against uh, the Prime Minister. Patrick Sullivan, at the outset, you were saying that uh, Theresa May was teetering on the brink. Changing your mind after those, uh, when you hear those reactions? Uh, well, I mean, they're the reactions that I expect, you know. Uh, From Jacob Rees-Mogg saying that she's going to hang on? That's, again, what you'd expect. I mean, he, he's he's a, a loyal party man to the, uh, to the end. He's not going to... He isn't going to uh, put the knife into his prime minister. Uh, but if there is a leadership election, he might feel there's a public service angle, for him, a public duty angle uh, for him to run. But he is not going to, to stick the knife into the back of his prime minister. Jacob Rees-Mogg, who says he's not submitted a letter, Alex Taylor, calling for Theresa May's resignation. Are we, or is the panel writing her off too soon? Well, I don't think many people want the job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's not, the, it's not the easiest job to carry out. I mean, they will pounce when they think they have the most chance. The reason why Jacob Rees-Mogg is not writing a letter is because, for the moment, he doesn't have the mathematics. It all comes down to mathematics again in the British Parliament to defeat the soft Brexiteers. There are simply not enough people who are going to follow him uh, on, a, on a confidence vote uh, so that he can, he can put up a challenge. But I think the challenge will come. I think, I mean, poor Mrs May, I think she's going to get fed up with this after. But the big problem of Brexit is actually the problem... Uh, and, and here I'm actually going to be, um, agree with, with your uh, panellists uh, uh, for once, um, your Brexiteers. The problem is in Theresa May's head. Uh, she was somebody who uh, campaigned for Remain. And then because there was a, a vacancy to become prime minister and because she wanted to become prime minister, she um, took, to. took on the, the, the role of becoming prime minister. So she had to change her mind. I mean, she's not Mrs Thatcher. I'm old enough to have lived through Mrs Thatcher's years uh, in, in Britain, and Mrs Thatcher at least had convictions and she carried them out. 
Theresa May is somebody who became Prime Minister and had to carry out something that she campaigned against. So the whole problem of Brexit is in Theresa May's head. And as long as it isn't resolved in her head, it'll never be resolved in Parliament or in the country or two in more, Europe. Two more reactions, these from the continent. Uh, the first, the President of the European Council weighing in. Donald Tusk uh, tweeting, uh, politicians come and go, but the problems they've created for people remain. I can only regret that the idea of Brexit has not left with Davis and Johnson, but who knows? Um, is that a little late? Jacques-Marie Lossian, your thoughts is uh, President of the European Council uh, sticking the knife in a little there, it seems? Um, I'm not sure to understand the who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, what we have seen... He's still hoping, it seems. Yes. The way I interpret it is he's still hoping for Britain to change its mind. Yes, for one good reason. Uh, when I, I was uh, looking at BBC uh, the night of uh, the vote, and um, what the most astonishing was that, first of all, the old ones have voted leave and the young ones have voted remain first. Uh, Scotland, Ireland have voted remain and the other part of England leave. Sublime. And if you look at the top 100 constituency where you add the highest rate of unemployment, they all have voted leave. Right, so it means it's not more. It you don't have a United Kingdom anymore, right? The kingdom is not united. You have a separated Ireland who has voted Remain, a separated Scotland who has voted Remain, young people who have voted oh, Remain, and cool the old though. ones who have voted Leave. And years after years, you have more young people Remainers and less old ones. Uh, All right. Leavers. And just one last reaction for now, the EU keeping calm, but uh, the uh, uh, commissioner, uh, who's the spokesperson, Marguerite Chinas, uh, he uh, sidestepping the questions about UK politics that we've been addressing head on, instead turning his punditry to a different matter that's on people's minds this week. One last word on the World Cup. Good luck to Belgium, Croatia, England and France who are the four EU uh, semi-finalists. May the best team win. Football is staying home in the European Union, where the trophy has been, as you know, since 2006. All right. A bit of an uh, indirect dig, perhaps, uh, at those uh, cheering for uh, Brexit there, reminding that England, for now, is still a member of the European <laughs> Union. I want to thank uh, very much Patrick Sullivan uh, for being with us Thanks from London, uh, Jamie Bryson in Belfast, Alex Taylor, Jacques-Marie Lossian, and uh, we'll be talking no more football now with Simon Harding. It's our World Cup Daily.